Hi, and welcome to a brand new episode of A Champion's Mind. Today, I have a very special guest. She is the founder, the clinical director at Brain Training Australia. One of her biggest goals is to help elite athletes change their mindset to reach peak performance. Welcome to the show, Elaine Corcoran. Elaine, how are you going today? Hi, Whitney. How are you? Thanks for having me on today. Yeah, so it's like before we get into it, I have to admit I have this bad habit on podcasts of saying the word obviously. I did heaps of editing yesterday. So if, if you hear me say it, you have to tell me off. Um, but tell us about you, Elaine. How did you get into this industry and how did you even become the director of Brain Training Australia? Well, make yourself comfortable because that's a bit of a long one. <laughs> um, so my background is in psychology. Um, I studied psychology. I did my master's in psychology. Um, and so I've always had an innate interest in human behavior and, and brain behavior. But um, when in 2005, I actually had a skiing accident and it left me with um, a fractured skull and tonic-clonic grand mal seizures. Yes. And so I was having um, really aggressive seizures every day. Um, prospects weren't looking good. Medication for life. Um, you know, they told me basically right off life. Um, you know, I'd have to have a carer. I'd have to wear a helmet. Um, I wasn't allowed to swim. I wasn't allowed to uh, take a shower on my own. I uh, couldn't be, ever be in a bath. Um, or a mass of water so uh, and I was told also that I could never have kids and that was a big thing for me so as a 25 year old being told all of the things that you can't do um, you know you're going to find a way around it so I was very fortunate to find myself a neurologist who specialized in neurofeedback brain training and working together with him he retrained my brain behavior um, which then led me to go back into my studies um, in neuroscience and to specialize in neurofeedback brain training yeah and uh, that's a long time ago now and I can happily say I'm seizure free medication free for many many years now and I also have a beautiful baby boy so never believe what you're told you can't do that's absolutely amazing and have you ever been skiing or not going down there again oh yeah like I went I even um, the year after and um, that accident, I went back skiing. So it was snowboarding. It was a snowboarding okay. accident, to get specific. And um, the next year I went back with a helmet and went skiing instead. So you kind of felt like your journey through that entire thing, you just wanted to dedicate the rest of your life and all your energy into helping other people. Well, the way that I see it is it's not, um, brain training is not just for people who have had seizures. It's to optimize your brain functionality. And what I found was, okay, it stopped the seizures, but it also cleared a lot of other stuff out of the closet. Like it, it um, you know, addresses stress and it just allows you to have ultimate clarity, focus, control, concentration. So it allows you to be the best version of yourself. So um, I'm really passionate about getting the best out of people. And that's why, you know, I got into psychology in the first place is because some people really struggle with life stressors that are thrown at them. And, um, and some people cope really well, but it's the continuous thing of having to cope. It yeah. should just come naturally to you um, that life is easy, that you can deal with life challenges. So my focus is really on helping people to, okay, optimize their brain functionality, but build mental resilience and, mm -hmm be able to um, be at ease at life and, and have the highest quality of life possible. Yeah. So like what would be some of your common breakthroughs that you have with your clients? Well, at one end of the spectrum, we see clients coming in in response to an issue. So, you know, they might be coming in with stress or anxiety or depression or ADHD or ADD or, 
you know, we see a lot of um, people with disabilities, with autism, with learning difficulties. Um, we even have, um, you know, people coming in just with everyday stress, but at a more extreme end of the scale, we have, um, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, um, traumatic brain injury. Uh, basically, anybody with a brain can benefit from brain training. But then, you know, when you kind of, um, when you come in in response to an issue, once you start building up the mental resilience and building up that brain capacity, performance, peak mental performance, where you can have ultimate concentration, clarity, um, concentration, focus, drive. Um, so it's all the good stuff, you know. So it's kind of like building a cake. You know, you got to, build your cake first and then you get to ice the cake and then you get to decorate your cake. So it's kind of like building the resilience is like building the cake, right? And then you get the good stuff. Um, you can't have the good stuff if you don't put in the hard work. And I know given your industry, you guys definitely get that. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, being in, in the fitness industry, but also a very competitive, competitive side, which is like obviously Muay Thai or boxing fighting, I've seen two spectrums um, or extreme ends of the spectrum. So obviously I'm just going to like paint the worst picture of, of these, the lower one. And that's like the people that come to us and they might be looking to really change their life. And they've got some goals like to get fit, lose 30 kilos. They might want to fight, but they have all the excuses under the sun. So they just can't break old habits. They can't get to, to moving forward or build momentum. And no matter what you do, it's like you're, you're hitting a wall with them. But then yeah. on the other end of the spectrum, you have these amazing people and they're obviously dominating it at work. They're, you know, winning fights or title belts, you know, mm. in all areas of their life. There's that one mm. theme and that's winning or doing really well. And it's not to say yeah. that they're not failing because they do. They just seem to get back on the horse and, and learn and go. go. Yeah. Where does that go with like the brain side of things? Yeah. So let's talk about brain behavior for a minute, because how your brain um, behaves results in your output behavior. So what you think becomes how you feel, becomes how you behave, right? That That's with everything. Yeah. Um, you know, how you react to a conversation, how you react in an argument, how you react when you're in the ring, um, how you perform when you have to public speak, for example. So, um, you know, if you were to um, think, I'm not good enough, you're not gonna feel I'm not good enough, and your behavior is going to be executed in congruence with that. Yeah. Um, but where we look at brain training and we look at brain behavior, it's not about the output, right? That's, that's what comes of step one and two, that's step three, right? And yeah. it's not yeah. just about the feeling, because the feeling, that's talk therapy, right? That's counseling and that's psychology. You know, we get into the feeling and um, explore all those feelings, but it's actually the thought process that's driving those feelings. So with brain training, we're working with that step one, um, the thought process. And when we look at the thought process, what contributes that, to that is um, there are so many factors that have to be taken into consideration. But, um, you know, at a very basic level, chemicals, the chemicals that are being produced in your brain are essential, are core to, um, to you feeling good and behaving well in, in a way that you want. Because if you're, um, so the difference between what you just described, somebody who is hitting a mental block and somebody who is thriving on what they do, the difference is the chemicals that are being produced in their brain, right? Um, yeah. And what they're fueling, you know, how are you fueling those chemicals, like through diet or, or um, you know, alcohol or, or substances or whatever. And what happens is um, when I'm talking about chemicals, I'm talking about, you know, um, serotonin, I'm talking about dopamine levels, I'm talking about cortisol, which is a stress hormone and how that actually, um, how that affects you when you're exercising and when you're training and, and keeping focused. Because Cortisol is a stress hormone and um, it can make us perform like circus monkeys yeah. Um, yeah. or it can make us pull up the handbrake in absolute fright and head for the hills. Mm. And so 
Um, and, and what I'm describing there is a fight or flight response, you know, which is um, anxiety is a stress response. So imagine a three story building. You have level one is everyday stress. You know, we have to do something which requires an exertion of, of energy on our behalf. So, you know, maybe we're running late for meeting and you're running, 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 or you're in panic mode trying to get something done. But then the task passes and your cortisol naturally self-regulates, right? So at these different levels, one, two, and three, cortisol is the stress hormone that's getting higher and higher and higher. So level two then would be high stress, um, yeah. where you know, you're under pressure all day, meeting deadlines, juggling a lot of balls in the air, but then you get to have downtime in the evening and you, you can't even remember what happened during the day, right? Because the stress has passed. But level three is anxiety. So it's like low stress, high stress, anxiety. And anxiety is a stress response. And the cortisol is really high up there, right? Yeah. And um, to get from level two to level one, you can do that pretty easily, right? Um, yeah. And I'll talk about how in a minute. But to get from level three to level two is really difficult. Um, and then it's easy to get from level two back down to level one. So what you want to do is always naturally regulate that cortisol. You know, you don't want to have your cortisol up in level three all the time because you will absolutely be exhausted. You'll be burnt out. Um, your, your brain will actually go into freeze mode. Um, yeah. You won't have that, you know, it'll wear down your mental resilience. Um, so... When you exercise, this is something that's really important, especially for anybody who you work with that has, um, you know, aerobic, who undertakes aerobic based exercises or weight bearing exercises, especially, is that when you exert um, yourself doing an aerobic exercise or a weight bearing exercise, your cortisol actually goes right up to the rooftop, right? So it goes level one, two, three, but it kicks in with adrenaline. Um, while you're training and cortisol and adrenaline are like two awesome party drugs and they have a great old workout together but then when you finish your training your adrenaline backs off and then your cortisol naturally naturally self-regulates uh, yeah. so that's why when somebody is really stressed and they go for a run they feel so much better after a run is because the court the adrenaline helps to burn off that cortisol and the stress levels come down. Yeah. Um, and it's also the reason why you might see somebody doing a weight bearing exercise and they get really angry in the first couple of minutes of their training session is because their cortisol kicks in, but the adrenaline hasn't kicked in yet. Yeah. And so yeah. it takes them a while to get into that zone. And when they do, then it becomes really fun doing that workout. Um, and, and as trainers, you know, you have to keep people motivated and hyped during their workout to try and encourage that adrenaline to, to kick in because sometimes it's very slow at kicking in for people depending on different circumstances like their BMI, like their diet, um, if they're fueling those transmitters with the right things, yeah. they'll be able to kick into those chemicals quite easily. But if they're not doing all these other things, then that's where your job as a trainer becomes a lot more difficult mm. um, to try and get that motivation levels up. So does that, does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I think that leads me pretty perfectly onto my next question is like with those peak performers, I find a lot of them reach like a ceiling that they create. And that's like, you know, for example, we had this guy training with us and he thought he could never get to like an Australian champ level. Mm -hmm. And he just put this big ceiling there. It was like it was impossible for him. Yeah what's like essentially why do people keep their, themselves safe in that situation is it something where it's just that brain freeze like it's just too much stress for a long period of time obviously we train all year round and it's like here's the ceiling there's the, the psychological answer to that but there's <laughs> also the neurological answer to that um so in terms of that that negative self-talk and you know putting a limit on yourself and that kind of thing um that can come from where resilience is down a little bit like if your resilience if your mental resilience is up and you're a hundred percent you will be so confident your self-esteem will be abundant you won't have any doubts about yourself and um you know and having confidence in self-esteem so let's just talk about confidence and self-esteem for a second because confidence is 
there's something I wanted, I'm going to go and get it and nothing's going to stop me. Um, whereas self-esteem is a lot more deeper than that. Yeah. Um, self-esteem is feelings of feeling inferior, feeling inadequate, um, not feeling entitled to the best things that life has to offer, comparing yourself to others, things like that. Yeah. So confidence and self-esteem are two very, very different things. Like your self-concept, your um, your self-identity, that all feeds into your self-esteem, right? Yeah. And so confident, people can fake confidence, right? Um, but ultimately, if you're faking something, it's going to catch up in you eventually. Yeah. It yeah. causes stress, right? Because there's an incongruence between what's real and what is. Yeah. Uh, and what isn't so where there is incongruence that will cause a stress and it will eventually nip you in the bud but so people can fake confidence but you cannot fake self-esteem you cannot fake your self-concept or your self-identity because yeah. they're so deeply ingrained right so that's kind of the psychological answer but when we look at um neurologically what's actually happening in the brain that drives that is you won't have a really good, strong self-esteem or self-concept or self-identity if your mental resilience is down, right? So if you're being wore down, and mental resilience can be wore down through a lot of cortisol, so too much cortisol yeah. being burnt, 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 right? And so um, continuously burning cortisol is continuous exposure to stress. Even if you're practicing with adrenaline during a workout, it's still stress, it's still cortisol. The brain is not that intelligent that it can tell the difference. It just knows how to produce these chemicals and to give you information of how to perform. It yeah. can tell the difference between, you know, um, having fun, having a workout, or um, running down the hill away from a bear that's trying to kill you. It just knows how to produce these chemicals. And um, because cortisol is, you know, originally, it's designed to protect us, right? It's, it's a stress hormone to, to get us to protect ourselves so that we don't com become complacent and, and get killed, for example. So if there was a bear attacking you, if there was a snake attacking you, if you were under threat in any, any way, um, your brain just knows how to produce the chemicals. It can't tell the difference of if it's a, if it's a life or death situation or if it's a workout. Um, yeah. Yeah. So continuous exposure to stress or continuous exposure to that burning off of, of cortisol um, can, can wear down your mental resilience. So you need to rebuild it. And how you rebuild it is um, with, with the approach that I have chosen to go with brain training is continuous exposure to stress will mean that you will work with the same circuit of neural networks over and over and over again, unless you're actively brain training or actively undertaken different activities in your life mm. to enhance neuroplasticity. And this is where we start to get really technical about how you can actually um, target what you want to achieve with your brain behavior. Because there's so many different things. You can hack your mindset um, by being aware of how these chemicals are being produced and then integrating different strategies to to, to optimize that brain functionality because if you're going around with the same circuit of neural networks all the time that's where you're going to get um you know the symptoms of anxiety and the symptoms of depression um, because it causes what's called neural dysregulation and with neural you see, so to be regulated is the ultimate goal but with neural dysregulation when you're stressed you get anxious very quick and when you're sad you get depressed very quick and yeah. when you start to self-regulate or build mental resilience, you get back down to ground zero. And that's ultimately where you want to be mm -hmm. um, is have self-regulation. Yeah. And obviously, here I go, obviously again, um, with these like peak performance and performance. So it's like in the gym, you know, at their work, whatever it is, I find that, especially for myself, we're always working in what I call their red zone. Like from mm -hmm. the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, there's always stress and I know that this isn't good <laughs> and I yeah. also don't support that super stressful. Um, what are some things that people can do just to make sure that they're kind of keeping their stress levels at a good level? Yeah, so there's so many things <laughs> but I'll give you the good stuff, right? I'll keep it brief and um, 
the first thing that now you know i take a little bit of a different approach so i'm not going to go oh this do this breeding technique and do this strategy because it has to be very tailored to that person like for example someone who has high stress and high anxiety they're not going to be able to do a breeding technique because they may hyperventilate right in the process <laughs> trying to you know how uh, apply this technique and and somebody who is stressed and someone who is anxious for example yeah. and and they mightn't even um call themselves anxious they mightn't even recognize it as anxiety because they think oh that's for somebody else but somebody who is prone to those um symptoms um they just think jesus this is another thing that i have to do haven't i got enough to do already so i would Park strategies like that until people have achieved somewhat of a de-stressor. And then you can start integrating those strategies into your everyday living life. But start off with this. Are you right-handed or are you left-handed? This is where we start. Um, so if you're right-handed, you're actually activating your left hemisphere. And your left hemisphere, your, your front left temporal lobe, is responsible for um, the critical thinking, analytical side of your brain, right? And if you're left-handed, you're activating your right hemisphere, which is the creative side of your brain, right? But we also know that people who are um, prone to anxiety, their right hemisphere can get really, really busy, really, really quick. So if you are creative in nature, that's a sign that if you're not being creative, your brain is really, really good at being stressed, right? Mm. So, and how you de-stress is how you be creative. So, I, no, this is like amazing. It, it really resonates with me so much. Yeah, cool. So, well, I hope so. <laughs> so, um, one really good thing to keep yourself on the straight and narrow is, okay, am I left-handed or right-handed? And what I want you to do is to actually use your non-dominant hand for a couple of days doing different tasks, right? Mm. And that might be something so simple as, okay, neuroplasticity is how we create new neural networks in the brain, right? And there's so many different ways that you can do that. And neuroplasticity is how we learn something. Once you learn something new, you're creating new neural networks in your brain, right? Yeah. So as little kids, we, we didn't know how to brush our teeth, right? So we learned that. We learned how to brush our teeth with our dominant hand. And now we do it like automatically. We don't even think about it. It's just a thing that we do two or three times a day and we, we don't have to think about it. It doesn't feel weird, it doesn't feel awkward. But you yeah. try brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand, right? Mm. It feels weird, it feels awkward, it's uncomfortable. That's neuroplasticity. Mm. So when you're really comfortable with doing something and you do things on autopilot, that's neuroplasticity, right? You've learned that, right? You're, yeah. you're really good at that, your brain knows how to do it. You teach it something new and you're playing a game. You're playing tricks with your mind because you're creating new neural networks. You're showing it to do something new, something different. So if you're right-handed and you have stress, get up out of bed every morning. And I'm going to give you other stuff before you get out of the bed, but get up out of bed every morning, go in and brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand. And you're starting, you're, you're actually giving your brain the best possible start to the day, right? Yeah. That at a very, very basic level. Um, Everybody in every household should have a jigsaw out on their kitchen table, on a dining room table, somewhere in their house, there should be a jigsaw. And use your non-dominant hand to place those jigsaw places, right? So jigsaws are really good at neuroplasticity. Yeah. We have been in crisis mode as, you know, across the world. And we see on Instagram and on Facebook, people are doing home exercises because it makes them feel good. But we also see that people are making jigsaws because it makes them feel good. This is why it makes them feel good. It's because you're creating neuroplasticity when you undertake those two activities, right? So obviously so, with like um, people that are super successful, they do the same thing every day. Like we drill routine, we drill habits. Mm. So this can actually be counterproductive to the way we feel about you know, our happiness essentially. It can be. Routine is actually very good, right? Because when you have a routine, your brain knows what to expect, 
right? And it's not going to have anything kind of thrown at it that isn't unexpected. And it's not going to spike the cortisol to make you go into defense mode. That's why routines are very important. When you integrate soft skills, such as using your non-dominant hand, um, and I'll give you an example of, of how it works. Um, it frees up the neural network. So it opened your mind to other possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. So routine is very, very important. Like say, for example, somebody who can play the guitar. If you have any clients who play the guitar out there, they're in the best possible, um, they have a really good skill set, a piano player as well. They have a really good skill set to tap into if they have high stress. So you check in on them. If they're having a, a stressful moment or if they're having a mental block, get them to play their instrument and then go back to what they're working on and you'll see it's a completely different person. And the reason for that is because when you play the guitar, you play the piano, you're actually using your two hands. So you're using your two um, hemispheres at the same time. So typically when a person is um, having a moment of stress or anxiety, they're going with the same circuit of neural networks, right? Yeah. And when you introduce, um, you know, your two hands on an instrument, for example, um, it, it creates new neural networks. So it's a, yeah, that's the ultimate win. But routines are, routines are important. Do not ditch the routines because <laughs> routines um, tell your brain what's common. You know, it knows what to expect. Um, it keeps the cortisol regulated. Uh, but then what happens to people who are so used to routine, if um, an unexpected task is thrown their way, it can, it can really quite um, elevate their stress levels. Yeah. So continuous exposure to stress is not good, but um, having zero stress as well isn't exactly a positive thing because then you don't know how to deal with it when it does come. Mm. So it's about finding that balance. You know, it, balance is key. Yeah. Um, so this is like another deep question and this is more of a, like a personal thing as, as being a coach and I get really upset when people play safe in their life and they don't take any risks and they, they know they want to do something else. Like they want to quit their day job and, and do something that they're passionate about, but maybe they can't afford it. What are the dangers of living in a safe zone? if that makes sense. Yeah, well, I, I suppose we kind of touched on it a little bit there um, mm. already because if you live in a, like if I was to pack up my life, and I've thought about this, if I was to pack up my life completely and move to a desert island, okay, I'd bring my family with me, kind of have to, but, <laughs> um, you know, and there was no other people around, right? And I lived a very safe life and, and you know, nothing bad ever happened you become bored, you become complacent, your brain isn't stimulated, mm. you won't thrive. I would probably die young because my brain isn't being challenged. Yeah. Um, so if you look at, um, look at the Mediterranean, look at the, the diet, the Mediterranean diet, and the exercises that the older people have integrated into their lives. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, they're really struggling right now because in Spain and in Italy, they're so used to having, you know, the older community meet each other and, and hang out and exchange views and conversations. They do that to mentally challenge each other. And if you're not being mentally challenged, um, you will become complacent. Your brain activity will slow down. And you basically need your brain to control all your other organs. Like your brain is the most important organ in your body yeah. and you know some people might think it's the heart and some people might think it's something else but it's actually the brain because it's the brain that gives information to all of these organs to function it's your brain that gives the directive it's the ceo of your body so if you're not looking after your brain you can't expect to have the best um output to have you know the best um thinking processes to have to feel the best um, and you can't expect the, the, you know, the best behavioral output as a result of that. So to push boundaries is really uncomfortable because yeah. you're creating your new neural networks. It's neuroplasticity. So um, when you do something different, when you do something new, when you push yourself beyond your comfort zone, um, 
that's neuroplasticity and you want that you, because otherwise your brain will just, it will lose the will to live. If you're going around with the same information and the same things, it's like, yeah, 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 I know what I'm doing. I know the drill. Um, so it is very important to put down because if you find yourself in your safe zone, um, you're not challenging yourself. Mm. I always think about that with fighting, like before you're shitting yourself, you're everything going through your mind, all the negative you know, thinking that you start to do, the anxiety. As soon as yeah. you're in there and you start, it's like the best feeling yeah. in, in the entire world. And then you leave the ring and you're like, I did that. Like, Ooh, yeah. yeah, and that's the feeling that I think a lot of us chase. Yeah. Um, I find that hard to do in work because it's like, I feel like work is like a, a thousand round fight. It never seems to end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. So just, just using that as an example, before you get into the ring, what's actually um, happening is your cortisol has gone up. The same thing happens to people when they have to public speak, right? Yeah. Um, you're anticipating, you're thinking about what's going to happen. You're thinking about how it's going to work. You have no idea. So you're actually high stress or even possibly anxiety thinking about it and so how people know that um they're in that level two level three danger zone um is you know that you can feel your heart um beating you you might get the shakes if, you, yep. if you're feeling um quivery at all and um and that means that when you do actually get in there okay your adrenaline is up but your 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 sorry your cortisol is up but your adrenaline hasn't kicked in yet Mm. So your brain is like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And that's where fight and flight comes in and freeze is another response. So you got in that stage, you got three responses, fight, flight, and freeze. Mm. And okay, fight. Awesome. You know, you're doing really well if you can pull that one out because you're, that's what you ultimately, what you want to achieve, right? But flight mm. is, oh my God, I can't do this. I need to remove myself from the situation and freeze is, well, that your opponent is winning. Um, so for you in that fight situation, it'll take you a couple of minutes to get into the swing of things. The good news is that your opponent also has a brain and your opponent's brain is also producing these chemicals. So that's why it does take a few minutes or seconds or minutes, not so much minutes in your scenario. You don't have minutes to spare, but um, you know, every second counts, but uh, it takes a while for that adrenaline to kick in so that you can have that ultimate um, to get into the zone, to, mm. to get the, you know, to get the best from your brain activity. And then when you leave, yeah, you still got some adrenaline going on. So you're like, the, you know, the, the self-confidence is up, the self-esteem is up because you've just had these two amazing naturally happening party drugs in your brain that's basically gone, hey, well done, I'm amazing, right? But eventually that wears off and then maybe the next day, yeah, you're still in a bit of high because maybe you won and but then you start self-reflecting on it because the adrenaline is backed off, the cortisol is backing off um, from the previous day. You get to self-reflect on it. And then you start criticizing yourself yeah, where you yeah. could have actually done better, right? We call um, it the, the post-comp blues. Yeah, and then, then you go down the rabbit hole, right? Yeah. And um, so there's different things that I would say, um, and, and, and there's techniques that I employ. Like I... You know, I do a lot of public speaking, so I stand up in a, a crowd of 700 plus people. And I remember one day um, this business asked me, oh, will you come and give a, a health talk um, to our staff? I said, oh, I'd love to. Wonderful. And I walked in and it was this massive auditorium with 800 people in it. And they had screens, um, a live feed for all of their uh, businesses across Australia and there was like thousands of people hooked up to each screen. And so I don't even know how many people were on this. But when I walked in, I went, mother of God, I thought I was going to meet like maybe 10, 12 people. <laughs> and the next thing, it's up in the thousands. How ridiculous. So, you know, in that moment, my brain can naturally go cortisol up. I haven't started talking yet, so I'm not in the flow. So adrenaline hasn't kicked in. Mm. And so it, that's just a natural occurrence for anybody. Now. I don't get stage fright, luckily, because I have techniques that I can employ. And you, know, you hear a lot of um, different methods and different techniques that you can use. But in that moment, just before you get into the ring, there is actually a really sneaky technique that you can pull out of the bag. 
um, that would keep your cortisol um, in check until you're in the zone and again, right, when you're in the ring. And that's, um, it's an EFT technique. So it's a tapping therapy technique. So for people who are public speakers and who have to perform, um, like in the ring, for example, you can use this. Now, EFT can get a little bit weird. It can get weird very quick because, you know, it, it's tapping therapy, right? So, you know, people tap their face on, on different meridians and things like that, but you can do it very, very sneakily. And you can just get, you, your middle finger and your thumb finger and do this, or you can do this, right? You're burning off. What happens is with that cortisol production is it can give you an excess energy, right? Mm. Um, and unless you're jogging on the spot and tapping it out through your feet, unless you burn off that excess energy, that will backfire on you. So, yeah. you know, you can, you can use some of these techniques to actually keep your cortisol in check until you're ready to um, get the adrenaline up and then you're in the right mindset to actually just boom go for it mm. so you don't want the cortisol kicking in first and then the adrenaline being down here you want to go in all in um which you will <laughs> yeah it's that um so say for example if i came to you or, or one of my you know fellow fighters what would they expect like i'm not i'm thinking like i did hypnotherapy last year and it's not like an instant life-changing thing. Is it you have homework? Do you run through them, you know, like connect them to special machines? Like kind of paint a picture of what you actually do with them. Yeah, so, so we do use special machines. <laughs> um, so we use advanced brain training technology. So the technology that we use um, is one of the most advanced brain training systems that's out there. Um, it's a very passive experience. So... There isn't, you don't have to do anything. You, um, you can be as cynical or as hypocritical as you like um, about what the process is because you literally just get to come in. We hook you up to some sensors on your head and ears. We get you to listen to some music. And at the same time that you're listening to, now the music is just, it's just a really nice relaxation music. So it's time out for you, right? And at the same time that you're listening to the music, it's a live feed of your brain activity into the music. So if you have a stress response or a dysregulated um, activity, you'll hear glitches in the music. So that's a live feed of the brain activity into the music. And when you hear that glitch, that's your brain naturally suppressed. So a lot of people, when they come to us, in that first um, appointment, it can sound like fireworks. If they've had continuous exposure to themselves under um, pressure, or if they have a high, um, you know, high stress in their lives, in their work or in their personal lives, or, you know, if they're like, a lot of people come to us, maybe they've ADHD, but we don't label people. We don't go, we're not medical, right? So we won't go, oh, you've ADHD or you have anxiety or you have depression. We don't want labels. Um, what we actually do is we just work with the goods that you have and your, your person is doing all the work in the session and the technology, we, we're really facilitators. So the technology and you are the two people, the two that are doing all the work. We're, there, we're just there to guide you through the process. So this, the technology detects inconsistencies um, in brain activity and gives you the information to naturally self-correct instantaneously. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to take brain scans. We don't need to tweak your brain as in, I will make this cortex a little bit higher and this cortex a little bit lower. Um, there's no human intervention. Uh, so there's no... Um, there are different types of neurofeedback brain training out there that actually involve that, but we don't use that. Um, ours is non-invasive and, um, and a much more holistic approach to brain training. So uh, we don't get in the way of how your brain should naturally be behaving. And there's no kind of preconceived notion of how your brain should be either. Like, you know, there's no setting your brain to the same frequencies as my brain and the two of us going around like two identical people. You know, that's just not realistic. Everybody is completely different and has completely different brain activity. And everybody has completely different lives outside of that. And so um, with regards to homework, Everything the brain training itself happens in the so session is an hour long, and that's where the main 
your um, your brain trainer and um, just sorry you have a chat with your brain trainer and um, then they start hooking you up to the technology and so you're actually actively trained in your brain for just over 33 minutes mm. and then they detach you from the systems and so on but your brain trainer will give you um, like things that I was talking about today about how to harness your neuroplasticity, how to you know different techniques and strategies um, suited to you that mm. you can actually integrate into your life to make life a little bit easier and to optimize your brain activity they're optional whether you employ those strategies or not you'll get you'll get the the optimal result anyway and um, just if you integrate different techniques and strategies along the way you get there a lot faster so it's as fast or as slow as you want it to be yeah mm, that's really really good um mm. is there any kind of like takeaway points you would love to send to the audience about, you know, really valuing this side of their training? Yeah. So, I mean, I suppose the main thing that I would say to people is um, tap into actively, um, you know, while we can, we can harness your brain's natural potential using technology, there are things that you can do um, to optimize your functionality in terms of sports performance um, in your everyday life. And things like, you know, there, there are special foods that you can eat to harness um, serotonin and your dopamine levels. Um, there's different things that you can do, like, um, before you get out of bed every morning have a notebook and a pen beside your bed and before you go to bed at night to get a good night's sleep make a list of all the things that you want to achieve the next day or things that you want to do and if you turn off the light and you're about to go to sleep and you think of something else jot it down on the list and then go back to sleep mm -hmm. and then when you wake up the next day actively work through that list right and what you can do is even but really unrealistic things on that, like very practical things in your day-to-day -day life that you take for granted like you put out the rubbish do the laundry um hang out the laundry put away the laundry it can be normal everyday stuff the reason i'm telling you to do this is because when you have a list, you're taking them off, you're naturally giving yourself that reward system and you're naturally giving yourself that dopamine level, right? Yes. So you can check out um, check out my blogs on my website. I write all the blogs myself. Hmm. And so there's different techniques and strategies on there that you can employ in your everyday life of how to harness serotonin and how to harness your dopamine levels. Um, and they're just really simple things. Obviously, a big lover of jigsaws, so that would be a really good thing to integrate into your life. Even if you're not a jigsaw lover, just do it for your brain's sake. Um, and what else is there? I mean, the training, um, make sure you're getting enough protein. Protein is really, really important. Like, I mean, I'm sure you guys sing this till the cows come home, but um, if you're looking for that instant fix through carbs or sugars, you're not giving your brain the best possible opportunity. It needs protein um, for longevity, and especially um, especially when you're training. Definitely piping on about that every single day. Get enough protein, protein, more protein. Yeah. Yeah. Your brain is craving it, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on our podcast. Um, I'm sure if anyone wants to get in contact with you, you'll let us know. So do they just kind of... You've got the website, so maybe tell them about that. Yeah, so, um, I mean, if anybody is interested in brain training, the very first thing um, that I would recommend is just book in with us. You can check out the website and you can make contact with me on the website. Just fill out a contact form, hit submit. It's really easy. And the first step from there is you actually get to do a free intake assessment with us. And that's where you get to meet one of our brain trainers um, our brain trainers are all over Australia. So we're in Sydney, Melbourne, um, Brisbane, but mainly in Perth. We have a huge presence in Perth because this is where I live and I'm really passionate about Perth. Um, but um, you get to meet a brain trainer one-on-one. -on -one. They, they all work in private practice. 
Um, so there's no waiting room. You're not meeting other people and in this human interaction, how we're set up. And you start with that free free consult. So you can learn if neurofeedback you and what you want to achieve. Um, and then from there, then you make, we make a plan. Awesome. Oh, okay. And Again, it's not expensive. To not be daunted, it's not expensive. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much again. And um, I hope everyone got something out of today. I know I did. Thank you again, Elaine. Have a great day. Cool. Pleasure, Whitney. Thanks for